This story is called The Taming of the Snook. It's by me, Leslie Atherton, and it's from a book called Wartime Tales. As was the case with everyone in the time of conflict, Mrs. Rena Armstrong had known better days. But Mrs. Armstrong waxed a little more lyrical than most when it came to discussing her pet subject, food. It is hard enough, she complained, with passion and conviction, to get hold of adequate food supplies for a common man's calorie requirements. It is even more so when your palate is discerning as mine is. At this point, Rena looked pointedly at her friend, Miss Penny Watson. Oh, of course, she agreed. It's always been one of your interests, Rena. Everybody knows that. Rena, who preferred being referred to as Mrs Armstrong by her friends, always prickled slightly as being referred to as Rena by Miss Watson in particular. But as ever, she let it slide. At least Miss Watson had an idea of what her life had been before rationing and scarcity took their toll on her pantry. I used to attend WI meetings, as you know, Miss Watson. Those stalwarts, Mrs Katrina Smith and Mrs Olive Taylor would bring rock cakes, scones, currant buns. I would also contribute. Of course you would, agreed Penny. But I would add herbs and fruit and flower petals to add piquancy and taste. Do you know that I was very politely asked to stop contributing, as the flavours were too foreign for their likings? I'm afraid I appreciate as little as they do, confessed Penny. But of course it matters not with you. You have only your relatively unsophisticated palate to share. You need only stews made with off-cuts of meat to be padded out with potatoes and flavoured with gravy browning salt and pepper. That is adequate, Penny dear, for all your needs. But it is not enough for me, as well you know. Penny nodded and muffled a small sigh. The addition of fragranced plants and unusual herbs and vegetables is essential. It is also essential to sample new tastes. Not easy in these difficult times. I can't even get enough food to stop my stomach rumbling, Rena. Quite so. The two ladies sipped their tea quietly for a few seconds. Can you tell the difference between cream and mock cream, Miss Watson? Egg and powdered egg? Mackerel and snook? Rena watched as Penny Watson considered the questions and huffed a little as Penny shook her head slightly. I'm such a dolt, she said. Does it matter? Not usually. Not for you. But for me it does. It's my upbringing, you see. It's what comes of being the only child of Marcel Arnett and of being at a most impressionable age at the time when he opened the first French restaurant in this whole town. I learned at the apron strings of the best. Yes, agreed Penny. Father would daily fill a stock pot with all the restaurants, vegetable cuttings. Soup was eaten before every meal and often was the part of the meal we enjoyed the most. I remember, began Penny, but Rena cut in. Before this stupid rationing, I'd regularly make fish stock from our meals trimmings, heads, bones and skins, then lightly sauté a little celery with some onion and herbs from the garden. I'd strain the liquid and reduce the delicious stock, then would add cubed potatoes, shredded kippers and peas, a swirl of cream and a little bit of watercress on the top would be the finishing touch. Even my father considered it delicious. Oh, it sounds, and I must confess I'm furious that there is now very little to add to my soup, not even an onion to sauté. All I have is pea pods, and they are less than useless. I use pea pods too. It's a travesty how impossible it is to get proper fish. Of course, when I get it, I'm sure to make the stock. Everything has to be used. No waste, remember, Miss Watson? Yep, yeah, pea pods are... I was desperate last week, Miss Watson, and there it was, fresh salted cod. Of course, I've never used it before. Why would I? I was desperate last week, Miss Watson, and there it was, fresh salted cod, cheap. Of course, I've never before used it. Why would I? I've never used any kind of salted fish, as it really is a substandard product. Because of that, nobody told me it would need soaking for two days and that I really should have asked the fishmonger to soak it beforehand. I bought it um, on Tuesday, I think it was, and fully expected to eat it that night. I was so disappointed, so very disappointed, as was Mr Armstrong, inevitably. 
I can't tell you his disappointment, as we may do with barley and leeks that night, and a mutton casserole the night after, and whale, whale, did you ever hear of anything more unappetising? Tins of snook, tins of whale meat, what on earth? Oh dear, muttered Penny. Oh dear indeed, both were flavourless, and that texture, oh. Why did nobody inform me I could have used the fish's soaking water as stock? Can you, should you? Penny's question ignored, Rena went on. So, after two days of soaking, and yes, I ensured that I left the fish skin at the top, and a couple of water changes, and wasting a heaped teaspoon of bicarbonate of soda in the process, it was ready. I drained it and cooked it, ready to make soup. Leftover mashed carrots and leftover barley. I drained the fish and rinsed it more than once. I assumed it would be palatable. Penny looked at Rena inquiringly. It required taming, so poor in comparison with my mackerel soup. So very, very disappointing. I am sorry, Rena, dear. Fish dust doesn't seem to cut the mustard nowadays. I tried to make a steamed fish roll, but it was a disaster. I attempted fish in savoury custard and baked it with turnips and marigold petals from the garden. Obviously, I had to bake that day to ensure I didn't waste the fuel used for the oven, so I used my egg and sugar for a small cake. But no, I cannot say that I was impressed. Oh dear, Penny sighed. Of course, I'm very conscious of waste and would never leave anything on my plate, but no, not pleasant. Do you know what I've found? What's that? asked Penny. That the only palatable way of eating dried or tinned or salted fish is fried with dripping, chutney and a little gravy powder. A little curry powder too. Curried cod. It was the only thing that covered up the revolting taste. Penny Watson got up from her friend's kitchen table and smoothed down her hair, then did the same to her skirt. Well, Rena, I really must be. It's such a terrible situation when you're short of supplies, so short of supplies, especially when you're used to so much better. I was reduced to mashing sweet with oatmeal and mixing it with the salted cod. They were sausages of a kind. You know that oatmeal is cheaper at the moment because of government subsidies. Penny turned to leave, but her friend's hand on her arm stopped her. Yes, it was cheaper when I bought it last week. I'm sure it was cheaper than that when I bought it the week before, even. Still, these sausages required a huge amount of rosemary to ensure they didn't suffocate me. Suffocate? Penny began buttoning her coat. Mind you, I should have used carrots. There has been a grand crop this year. The farmers have been working very hard to keep up stocks, and they are so good for one's skin. They keep illness at bay, so I do try to eat as many as I can, don't you? Penny sat down again and began unbuttoning her coat. I even have them raw on top of cold-cooked salad potatoes with vinegar. Carrot jam is quite nice. Oh, no, my dear, far too sloppy. Oh, I must disagree with you there. I think it's very nice. Well, of course, we can't take your taste buds as good judges, despite the fact that the Ministry of Food recommends we eat green vegetables and root vegetables every day. I would have done that already. Usually I eat cabbage, but it isn't always easy to buy. And nowadays the farmers do better with the carrots and turnips. They keep better, you know. And one acquires the greens along with the roots. Penny sighed and fiddled with the hem of her skirt. A thread was hanging loose. She pulled it a little. My dear, leave it be. We do not repair our clothing in company, do we? Oh yes, Jackson's greengrocers gave me a whole basket full of turnip tops. Perfect for the vitamin C and health of one's skin. But Mrs Carlson from next door told me I could soak the white parts in water to root them. One grows a new turnip and new turnip tops. I made a space in the vegetable patch, you know, the one that used to be the rose bed, and I pushed my rooted tops into the earth. So very thrifty, mumbled Penny. Of course, marrows also grow so well in this area, don't they? I make chutney with them when I can get the sugar and fruit and spices. Other times I can bottle them or dry them. They're so watery, but it's better than nothing. And a bit of a change, like dried apple rings. They aren't anything like as nice as pies, or even the, the real raw and crispy apples. But they are better than nothing. I do enjoy a fresh stuffed marrow. 
My stuffed cabbage is beautiful. Both are such economical ways to stretch out the meat. I, I made fish paste with salted cod, said Penny. I'm sure it tasted as horrid as the parsley honey you made. That was a treat. I used all my sugar. It tasted very nice. Nonsense. It's nothing like heather honey at all. Penny Watson began to shuffle. She was a young woman who lived with two other shop worker friends. They split their bills but rarely cooked for each other. That meant there would be no supper waiting for her return. The clock on the wall of Rena Armstrong's kitchen said that the time was half past five. Penny wanted to be at home for when Peter called. He tended dairy cattle and sometimes brought food gifts to her. They'd been courting for more than one year and had both wondered absently if perhaps it was time to marry. From outside of her thoughts, Penny realised that Rena was still talking. I salted the pile of beans, but they were not successful, and I cried for a whole day. Such a terrible waste. Not enough salt, my dear. They went mouldy and mushy. Perhaps you didn't pack. Not enough salt. Nothing to do with how tightly they were packed. Um, well, Rena, I really must be on my way now, Penny said as she rose again. Rena Armstrong finally let her friend go and returned to the kitchen to skim her sheep's head stew. Penny Watson made her way purposefully back home. All the talk of food had hungered her, and she returned quickly, without taking the usual share of harvest from the wayside. The lanes were always generous with their slows, elderflowers, rowans, nuts, hips and haws. But Penny, despite her hunger, did not stuff anything into her coat pockets. Instead, she rushed into her kitchen, set her blackberry leaf and barley water tea to warm and her lamb breast to roast in the oven, along with the bread she'd left rising that afternoon. With thoughts of liver and bacon hot pot with dumplings, Penny hoped that the war would end soon.